Thank you guys for coming. Once again, this is part 14 of Extremist Literature. Uh, we are covering the book Pure Worship of Jehovah by Jehovah's Witnesses. And we left off last time on section 3. So we finished up sections 1 and 2. Now we're on chapter 8 in section 3. Uh, before we actually get into it, let me just go to the top here and just take a quick glance at the table of contents. Because I was wondering how far in the book we are. So they have this split into sections. Um, they have the introduction, that's uh, chapters 1 and 2. Then section 1 is chapters 3 and 4. Section 2 is chapters 5 to 7. And then section 3, which is the one we're on now, that's chapters 8 through 14, pages 83 to 148. And then section 4 is chapters 15 to 18, and then section 5, the last section, chapter 19 to 22. So we're, we're moving along pretty well. Uh, we are 14 parts in now, chapter 8. That's not too bad. I'm pretty happy with our progress. We've been getting through about... Uh, one chapter every two weeks, roughly. Okay, let's get back to chapter 8. So here's the focus of chapter 8. The title is, I Will Raise Up One Shepherd. Uh, and the focus is four messianic prophet. I'm sorry, four messianic prophecies and their fulfillment in Christ. I'm a little bit confused about what that means. I imagine they will reveal it to us as time goes on. Uh, they have some really nice pictures here um, right above the the opening page for chapter 8. The opening page for section 3, it's a picture of a cliff uh, with a mountain above the cliff and a city at the base of the mountain. It says, I will, ellipsis, dot, 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 collect you together. Restoration of pure worship promised. It says, uh, the focus of this section is restoration revealed in Ezekiel's prophecies. Israel, it says, Israel is shattered, her unity torn by apostasy. She is suffering the consequences of her actions. She defiled pure worship and defamed God's name. Amid the despair, Jehovah moves Ezekiel to utter, to utter a series of prophecies that offer hope. Using striking word pictures and awe-inspiring visions, Jehovah encourages not just the captive Israelites, but all who long to see pure worship restored. Okay, peculiar. Uh, so that was the opening to section three. Here is chapter eight, paragraph one. And actually, paragraph one is short, so I'm going to cover paragraphs one and two. It is the sixth year of Ezekiel's exile. The prophet's heart is heavy as he reflects on the sad state of rulership in Judah, his beloved homeland hundreds of miles away. He has seen rulers come and go. Ezekiel was born in the middle of the region of faithful King Josiah. Ezekiel must have been thrilled when he learned about the campaign Josiah had conducted to destroy graven images and to restore pure worship in Judah. But Josiah's efforts did not lead to permanent reform, for he was followed by kings who for the most part continued to practice idolatry, not surprisingly, under such bad rulers, the nation has sunk ever deeper into the mire of spiritual and moral decay. Is all hope lost? By no means. Okay, interesting. Very strange. Uh, it says, But Josiah's efforts did not lead to permanent reform. He was followed by kings who, for the most part, continued to practice idolatry. Jehovah's Witnesses are kind of weird about idolatry. Because it's like, one of their examples of idolatry is people wearing cross necklaces around their necks or, uh, you know, having rosary beads or, or any other number of things like that. I feel like idolatry is worshiping a physical object, right? Wouldn't that be idolatry? Actually, let me just look up the meaning out of curiosity. I'm wondering... Um, Worship of idols, extreme admiration, love, or reverence for something or someone. Uh, it, I don't know. It, it just it doesn't feel like 
people wearing a cross necklace are idolizing that cross to me. I feel like that's a little bit over the top to call that idolatry uh, and any number of other things that Jehovah's Witnesses call idolatry. Like worshiping the golden calf in the Bible. Everybody knows that story of the golden calf. That was idolatry. They were worshiping this golden calf, as far as I can tell, right? Wanting to have a good job to make good money, that's not idolizing money. That's not idolatry, as Jehovah's Witnesses say it is. Okay, so let's move on. This is paragraph three. Jehovah inspires his faithful prophet to record a prophecy, the first of several, about the Messiah, the future ruler and shepherd who will permanently restore pure worship and tenderly care for Jehovah's sheep. Tenderly care for Jehovah's sheep. Okay. We do well to consider those prophecies carefully, for their fulfillment affects our everlasting future. Let us then examine four messianic prophecies found in the book of Ezekiel. Okay. So, I guess we're going to look at four messianic prophecies found in the book of Ezekiel, supposedly. I'm not 100% clear on what they mean by messianic prophecies. I guess these are supposed to be prophecies that prophesy that Jesus was the Christ or whatever. Uh, Hopefully, they will clarify that for us because I'm a little bit confused on that. So, the first subheading we've just approached is called, A Tender Shoot Becomes a Majestic Cedar. Okay, let's hit paragraph four. About 612 BCE, the word of Jehovah came to Ezekiel, and he, re- uh, I'm sorry, and he related a prophecy that shows the scope of Messiah's rule and the need to trust in his kingdom, and that was in italics. Jehovah introduced the prophecy by directing Ezekiel to tell his fellow exiles a prophetic riddle that illustrated the faithlessness of Judah's rulers and underscored the need for the righteous messianic ruler. Okay. Uh, That kind of felt like word salad to me, just right off the bat. Uh, The next paragraph is 5, and it says, Read Ezekiel 17, 3 through 10. It says, Say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. A great eagle with powerful wings, long feathers, and full plumage of varied colors came to Lebanon. Taking hold of the top cedar, he broke off his topmost shoot, he broke off its topmost shoot, and carried it away to a land of merchants, where he Uh, planted it in a city of traders. He took one of the seedlings of the land and put it in fertile soil. He planted it like a willow by abundant water, and it sprouted and became a low, spreading vine. Its branches turned toward him, but its roots remained under it. So it became a vine and produced branches and put out leafy boughs. But there was another great eagle with powerful wings and full plumage. The vine now sent sent out its roots toward him, from the plot where it it was planted and stretched out its branches to him for water. It had been planted in good soil by abundant water so that it would produce branches, bear fruit, and become a splendid vine. Say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Will it thrive? Will it not be uprooted and stripped of its fruit so that it withers? All its new growth will wither. It will not take a strong arm or many people to pull it up by the roots. And this is 10, the last... uh, the last verse. It has been planted, but will it thrive? Will it not wither completely when the east wind strikes it? Wither away in the plot where it grew. Okay, that's confusing. So I guess it's just kind of a weird little story about uh, an eagle ripping up a, a cedar and planting it somewhere, and somehow it, it grows into a vine or something. Kind of strange. Okay, so they wanted us to read that um, that chapter, or that verse, excuse me. They wanted us to read those verses. So it says, here is the gist of the riddle. Okay, so right off the bat, we just read something from Ezekiel that was kind of confusing, kind of weird, just kind of talking about an eagle with full plumage, taking a branch from a tree, and it grew out into a vine, Right. Now Jehovah's Witnesses in paragraph 5 of this book that they wrote, they're going to tell us what this riddle means because they know. Because they're anointed by God. They're special. They're, they're different from everybody else. And they have more information than everybody else does. So let's see what, that, what they believe this riddle to mean. It says, here's the gist of the riddle. A great eagle, quote-unquote, plucks off the topmost shoot of a cedar tree and sets it down in a city of traders. 
The eagle then takes some of the seed of the land and plants it in a fertile field by abundant waters. The seed flourishes, growing into a sprawling vine. Next, a second great eagle appears. The roots of the vine reach eagerly toward the second eagle, seeking to be transplanted by it to another well-watered spot. Jehovah condemns the vine's actions, indicating that its roots would be torn out and that it would uh, dry up completely. That's kind of strange. Jehovah condemns the vine's actions? I swear this book is just an enigma in itself. Okay, so that was paragraph five. Now here's six. What did the riddle mean? Read Ezekiel 11 to 15. Um, That's the next five verses, I think. Uh, So it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me. Say this, I'm sorry, say to this rebellious people, do you not know what these things mean? Say to them, the king of Babylon went to Jerusalem and carried off her king and her nobles, bringing them back with him to Babylon. Then he took a member of the royal family and made a treaty with him, putting him under oath. He also carried away the leading men of the land, so that the kingdom would be brought low, unable to rise again, surviving only by keeping his treaty. But the king rebelled against him by sending his envoys to Egypt to get horses and a large army. Will he succeed? Will he he who does such things escape? Will he break the treaty and yet escape? So that was Ezekiel 17, 11 through 15. So it says, what did that riddle mean? And then it tells us to read the verses we just read. In 617 BCE, now remember their timelines are completely twisted around and incorrect. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, the first great eagle, besieged Jerusalem. He plucked Judean king uh, Jehoiachin, Jehoiachin, the topmost shoot, quote-unquote, from his throne and brought him to Babylon, a city of traitors. Nebuchadnezzar put Zedekiah, one of the royal seed of the land, on the throne in Jerusalem. The new Judean king was made to take an oath in God's name, obligating him to be a loyal vassal king. But Zedekiah despised his oath. He rebelled against Babylon and turned to the Egyptian pharaoh, the second great eagle, for military help, but to no avail. Jehovah condemned the disloyal actions of that oathbreaker, Zedekiah. In the end, Zedekiah was dethroned and he died in prison in Babylon. Okay, so we just read these verses from Ezekiel that were talking about an eagle and, you know, it plucking a branch and dropping it off somewhere else, so on and so forth. And Jehovah's Witnesses have this whole timeline laid out about kings that did this thing and that thing. And the timeline is most, it it is for sure wrong in many places, in some places at the very least. They're incorrect about some of their assessments here. I mean, we know that objectively. We just know they're wrong about it. Um, But they have this whole timeline laid out about Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon and Zedekiah and, um, you know, all of these other kings and places, Egyptian pharaohs. uh, They're laying out this whole thing like they know exactly what's happening. And they're superimposing these verses from Ezekiel on top of this timeline that they've drawn up. Uh, They're artificially imposing this this prophecy quote unquote that they're reading so it's kind of an obscure confusing verse that you're reading it doesn't really seem to have a connection to anything on the outside right it's just an eagle with big plumage carrying branches off and carrying them toward water but jehovah's witnesses being anointed being close to god closer than anybody else according to them no exactly what these verses mean, because God is telling them what these verses mean. He's not telling us, he's telling them. They know, and we have to go to them to get the answers. So they're, they are imposing this information on, uh, on this verse. Uh, the, you know, the verses after the, the whole eagle thing, like Ezekiel 17, 3 to 10, talk about the eagle picking up the branch and stuff. And then 17, 11 to 15, talk about a royal family making a treaty and breaking an oath and things like that, kind of giving a little bit more explanation to it. 
But Jehovah's Witnesses are, are, are taking it a step further than that and claiming that they know exactly what this verse is talking about. Okay, so that was paragraph 6. Let's take a look at paragraph 7. What lessons can we learn from the prophetic riddle? First, as pure worshipers, we need to be true to our word. Okay, so they have, they have this whole timeline written up here, and they take these verses from the Bible and they superimpose them on this timeline that they've written up. And now they're deriving lessons for their members from this fabricated timeline that they have. What lessons can we learn from the prophetic riddle? First, as pure worshipers, we need to be true to our word. Let your word yes mean yes, your no, no. I'm sorry. Let your word yes mean yes, your no, no, said Jesus. If we find it necessary to swear before God to tell the truth, such as when testifying in a court of law, we view such an oath as a serious matter. Second, we must guard against misplaced confidence. The Bible warns us, Do not put your trust in princes nor in a son of man who cannot bring salvation. I find it fascinating that they said this. They said, If we find it necessary to swear before God to tell the truth, such as when testifying in a court of law, we view such an oath as a serious matter. I know that many uh, people listening to this who aren't ex-Jehovah's Witness may not know this about Jehovah's Witnesses, but... The Australian Royal Commission famously investigated Jehovah's Witnesses a while back over child abuse cases, and they called some governing body members to testify in open court. And, uh, of course, Jehovah's Witnesses have an issue with swearing an oath on certain Bibles, so they were allowed to swear an oath on the New World Translation, their version of the Bible. Uh, their translation of the Bible. They put their hand on that thing, and they swore to tell the whole truth, and they lied under oath. The governing body members did. There's recording of it on YouTube. You can listen to them lying. I mean, you know they're lying for a fact. You know they, they know that what they're saying is not true. It's called theocratic warfare. They will do or say whatever it takes to protect themselves. It's just so interesting to me that they're sitting here now saying, if we find it necessary to swear before God to tell the truth, such as when testifying in a court of law, we view such an oath as a serious matter. To be fair, the thing that they lied about, it was, it was not so much a lie as a complete twisting around of the facts. So they were asked about corporal punishment, which means spanking kids. And they were asked about how they treat people who are disfellowshipped and how do they treat family members who are disfellowshipped. Now, it may be a fact that their books don't say that you should shun a family member if they're disfellowshipped, but they sure as hell encourage that. They sure as hell force it down people's throats. If, if a mother is talking to a son who is disfellowshipped, the mother will be counseled by the elders, and she will most likely have privileges taken away. That's in the elders' manual. I've talked about it I mean, on, on my main channel. I've pulled up the elders' manual and read it straight from the book, exactly what's supposed to be done if uh, a mother is talking to a disfellowshipped son. So, sure. Technically speaking, maybe they weren't exactly lying, but they were twisting that truth into knots at best. So, okay, so that was paragraph seven. Sorry, I'm still getting over my cold. So here's, uh, this is paragraph eight. And actually, I'm going to read nine also because it's kind of short. There is, however, uh, actually, you know, let me just read the last sentence in seven so that we can get some context. The Bible warns us, do not put your trust in princes nor in a son of man who cannot bring salvation. Here's eight. There is, however, a ruler who is fully worthy of our confidence and trust. After presenting the prophetic riddle about the transplanted uh, shoot, Jehovah drew on the same poetic imagery to describe the future messianic ruler. Okay, so before I get to nine, 
here they're saying we shouldn't be putting our faith in or our trust in earthly rulers, quote unquote. We shouldn't be putting our trust in governments, in secular governments on earth. We should be putting our trust and faith in Jesus, basically, in Jehovah. And I understand that's a fine message, I guess, for Christians, if they want to believe that. But Jehovah's Witnesses are going a step beyond that. It's not just, don't put your faith in earthly rulers, put your faith in God. It's not like that. It's not that simple with Jehovah's Witnesses. They are actively hoping that secular governments get destroyed. They are they would be anarchists if it weren't for the fact that they actually want a theocracy. It's not they don't want no government. They don't want any government run by anybody except for themselves. That's the issue. They want a theocracy run by them under God, quote unquote. That's their goal. Okay, so let's take a look at number nine. What the prophecy says, that, that's in italics for some reason. Uh, it says, read Ezekiel 17, 22 to 24. That's actually pretty short, so let's give it a read. It says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will take a shoot from, uh, from the very top of a cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the, the low tree grow tall. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. God, these are like, this is confusing. I, I don't know the last time I used the word sprig. I knew the word. I knew it existed. I knew how it was spelled. I just don't read it or speak it very often. Some of these words are like very, very strange. Sprig, splendid cedar, very strange. Okay, so that was Ezekiel 17, 22 to 24. It says, now, it's not, uh, now it is not great eagles, but Jehovah himself who will take action. He will pluck a tender shoot from the top of the lofty cedar and plant it, ellipsis, dot, 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 on a high and lofty mountain. This shoot will flourish, becoming a majestic cedar, providing lodging for every kind of bird. Then all the trees of the field will know that it is Jehovah himself who has made this majestic tree flourish. Here's the issue, okay? The Bible is a big book. It's full of all kinds of information. And there's a verse in there to support just about any position you want. Uh... And a lot of it comes down to interpretation, I guess you could say. Like, for example, um, is the Noah's Ark story literal or was it a metaphor? How do you interpret that? That's going to guide your, your entire worldview. Your whole worldview is going to be based off of whether or not you think this was literal. So the Bible is complicated anyways, period. I mean, just bottom line, it's complicated, it, it's impossible to know what the author's intent was, but here we have Jehovah's Witnesses taking it a step further beyond just, uh, you know, simple interpretation, like this verse could mean one of two things and we're picking this one. It's beyond that. They're actually superimposing information onto it and prophesying. They are, they are deeming themselves prophets. Uh, and trying to understand what the what these verses are saying, it's absolutely unreasonable to think that they they have any information that any of us don't. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, that was paragraph nine. Next one is ten. I'm just taking a quick glance through here. One second. Um, okay, next one is ten. Let's give it a read. How the prophecy is fulfilled. Okay, so a couple of these. All right, so the last paragraph started out with italics that say, what the prophecy says. So that's what paragraph 9 was about, what the prophecy says. And here's number 10, how the prophecy is fulfilled. And actually, number 11 is, 
what we can learn from the prophecy. All right, so here's 10. Jehovah plucked his son, Jesus Christ, from the kingly line of David, the lofty cedar, quote unquote, and planted him on heavenly Mount Zion, a high and lofty mountain. Jehovah thus took his son, who was considered the lowliest of men, by his enemies and exalted him by giving him the throne of David his father. Like a majestic cedar, the messianic king, Jesus Christ, will tower over the entire earth and be a source of blessing for all his subjects. Here, indeed, is the ruler worthy of our trust. In the shade of Jesus' kingdom rule, obedient humans, earthwide, will dwell in security and be undisturbed by the dread of calamity. That's apparently Proverbs 133. Interesting. Yeah, so Jehovah's Witnesses are just taking verses and imposing a story onto them. That's what they're doing. They're prophesying. No reason to think that they're correct about this at all. No reason to think that they have any inside information that we don't. But their members have kind of been primed to... I mean, their members have been primed to to believe that they are prophets, that they are special, that they have a direct line to God, and that they do have the authority to determine what these verses mean. I mean, it's like I said, interpretation is one thing. This is prophesying. This is one step beyond interpretation. Number nine was what the prophecy says. The one we just read is how the prophecy is fulfilled. That's where they're telling us what the Bible is talking about somehow. I don't know how they, they've come to the conclusion that they know more about it than we do. And here's number 11, what we can learn from the prophecy. The thrilling prophecy about the tender shoot that becomes a majestic cedar enables us to answer an all-important question, in whom will we place our trust? It is foolish to trust in human governments and their military might. To find real security, we are wise to place our full confidence and trust in the Messianic King, Jesus Christ. The heavenly government in his capable hands is mankind's only hope. So like I said a minute ago, this goes beyond just put your faith in God. Don't put your faith in uh, secular governments. It, it, it's a step beyond that. They don't want you to be involved in in secular governments. They want you to be completely separated from society, from society and from the government that helps maintain that society. Okay, so that was number 11. Uh, The next subheading is actually, uh, give me one second, I'm just taking a look through here. Um... Next subheading is entitled, The One Who Has the Legal Right. I can only imagine what they're, what that means. Okay, so there are 27 paragraphs in this one? Yeah. 27. Okay. I'll tell you what. Let's read one more subheading, and uh, and then we'll call it quits for the night. So this one is called, The One Who Has the Legal Right. Here's paragraph 12. From the divine explanation of the prophetic riddle about the two eagles, Ezekiel understood that Zedekiah, an unfaithful king in the, in the royal line of David, would be dethroned and taken captive to Babylon. Perhaps the prophet wondered, what about God's covenant with David, which promised that a king from David's family line would rule forever? If Ezekiel did ponder such a question, he did not have to wait long for an answer. About 611 BCE, which is the wrong timeline, that's not the correct year for this event. In the seventh year of the exile, while Zedekiah was still ruling in Judah, the word of Jehovah came to Ezekiel. Jehovah had him relate another messianic prophecy, one that made clear that God had not abandoned his covenant with David. On the contrary, the prophecy indicated that the future messianic ruler, now this is in italics, the future messianic ruler would have the legal right to rule as the heir of David. Okay, I see what they're doing here. The future messianic ruler would have the legal right to rule as the heir of David. So I guess they're saying that God promised that somebody from the line of David would rule forever. And Zedekiah was from the line of David, but he turned out to be a bad guy, so he's getting dethroned. 
and that would reverse it, right? But what they're saying here is that Jesus is from the line of David, and he has the legal right to rule. So, okay, that's that's kind of strange. Uh, let's take a look at 13. What the prophecy says. Uh, it says, read Ezekiel 21, 25 to 27. Let's give that a quick read. It says, You profane and wicked prince of Israel, whose, whose day has come, whose time of punishment has reached its climax. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Take off the turban, remove the crown. It will not be as it was. The lowly will be exalted, and the exalted will be brought low. A ruin, a ruin. I will make it a ruin. The crown will not be restored until he to whom it rightfully belongs shall come. To him I will give it. Okay, so it says what the prophecy says, and it says read Ezekiel 21, 25 to 27. In no uncertain terms, Jehovah through Ezekiel addresses the wicked chieftain of Israel, whose time of punishment has arrived. Jehovah tells this wicked ruler that his turban and crown, or diadem, apparently, it says, symbols of royal power, would be taken from him. Then ruling powers that had been low would be raised up, and those that had been high would be brought low. The ruling powers raised up hold sway, but only until the one who has the legal right comes. Then Jehovah gives the, uh, I'm sorry, then Jehovah gives that one the kingdom. And of course, Jehovah's Witnesses are implying or outright saying that that person is Jesus. The one that has the legal right, quote unquote, is Jesus. It's like they're tying this all into a knot. It's like super confusing to kind of try to make sense of. Okay, so on um, the page right before the page that we're on now, on page 88, it says three messianic prophecies. There's a, a graph or a timeline, I guess you could call it. It says the one who has the legal right. And the timeline starts at 607 BCE. It says Zedekiah is dethroned. Oh, I love it. Okay, this is... So it goes from 607 BCE to 1914 CE. Of course, we all know 1914 is a super significant date to Jehovah's Witnesses because of their ridiculous Bible math. So 607 BCE, it says Zedekiah is dethroned, and then it says Gentile times all the way to 1914. And then under 1914, it says Jesus, the one with the legal right to the Messianic kingdom, enthroned as king, becoming shepherd ruler. Oh, I love it. So Charles Taze Russell, the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, famously made this prediction based off of the year 607 BCE. So he basically said um, that from the time Jerusalem falls, we're going to count this many days, which we get from the book of Daniel, and we're going to convert them to years based on this verse from Numbers, and then we're going to do this thing and that thing, and and we end up with 2,520 years, right? So we have this number of years, 2,520, just based on this weird Bible math that he concocted. And they, and he, what he did was he started counting from the fall of Jerusalem, which he believed to be 607 BCE. We now know he was wrong. Jerusalem fell in 586, 587 BCE, not 607, okay? So it was, um, what, 20 years later. So this date of 1914 is incorrect because, it, you know, we're basing this off of the assumption that it was 607 plus 2,520 years would put us at 1914, um, discounting the year zero. But since we know it was 587, that would have actually put us in... 1934, not 1914, right? Well, he already made the prediction, Russell did, Charles Taze Russell did. He already put it all over his literature, he already made a big deal out of it, like the end is coming in 1914, he had sound cars out there with phonographs, phonograph, is that what it's called? Phonograph? Big old phonographs on top of these cars just playing these messages about the end coming in 1914 and stuff like that. So how was he going to deal with that? He couldn't back out of that. He made such a big deal out of it, he couldn't possibly back out now. 
So what he did, 1914 rolls around. He walked into a room, famously, full of Jehovah's Witnesses and said, The Gentile times are over. Jesus came back. He just came back invisibly. That's what he said. He said, Jesus came back invisibly. We just didn't see it happen. But the end is right around the corner now. We're in the end times currently, according to him. Um, That's been for over 100 years. So, still waiting. But, uh, yeah, that's the graph that they have here. 607 to 1914. So, they have taken all of these... Um, these pro- these weird verses from the book of Ezekiel, these kind of confusing verses about eagles and branches and things. And they have this narrative that they've already set up and they've already planned out. And they're, they're superimposing this narrative onto the verses. So that's, that's what they're doing. That's their plan. And that's how they're proving themselves to, their Je- to Jehovah's Witnesses, to their members by superimposing their ideas and philosophies, their preconceived ideas and and ideology, by superimposing that stuff onto verses in the Bible, trying to make sense of them. It's ridiculous. Okay, so the last paragraph we read was 13. Uh, Let's see. Let's give 14 a read. In 607 BCE, With the destruction of Jerusalem, which now we know, of course, it was 587, the high kingdom of Judah centered in Jerusalem was brought low when the Babylonians destroyed that city and took captive the dethroned King Zedekiah. Then, with no king in David's royal uh, line ruling in Jerusalem, the low Gentile powers were raised up, leaving them in control of the earth, but only for a limited period of time. The Gentile times, or the appointed times of the nations, ended in 1914 when Jehovah conferred kingship on Jesus Christ. As a descendant of King David, Jesus indeed had the legal right to the Messianic kingdom. Hence, in Jesus, Jehovah fulfilled his solemn promise to give David a permanent heir to an everlasting kingdom. I find that really fascinating. Okay, so... Let's just assume that Jesus did not come back and take kingship in 1914. Just tossing it out there. Um, Does that mean that God did not fulfill his solemn promise to give David a permanent heir to everlasting kingdom? Does that mean that Jehovah's Witnesses must be right? And if this date of 1914 is incorrect, as it in fact is, does that mean that their entire philosophy is wrong? Everything from the ground up about their religion is wrong? Yes, everything about their religion is wrong, if that date is wrong, and it is. They're leaning into this date when they know it's wrong. I mean, at this point, they're, they're, they're basically saying that they believe Jehovah over secular historians and scholars. Jehovah told them when Jerusalem fell, and these secular scholars and historians can take their facts and stick it. It's just insane. Okay, so here's another piece of... Let's just finish up paragraph 15 here. It says, what can we learn from the prophecy? We can have the, uh, the utmost confidence in the King, Jesus Christ. Why? Because unlike worldly rulers who may be elected by humans or may usurp ruling authority, Jesus was chosen by Jehovah and given a kingdom to which he has the legal right. Surely the king whom Jehovah himself has appointed deserves our confidence. Okay, so that's the last uh, paragraph we're going to hit this time, but there is another graph here. So the graph above that we were talking about it shows Zedekiah dethroned 607 BCE. Then it shows Gentile times from 607 to 1914. And it shows 1914, Jesus, the one with the legal right to the Messianic kingdom, enthroned as king, becoming shepherd ruler. Okay, so there's another graph here, and it shows from 1919 CE to after Armageddon. Um, and there's a little wrinkle in the timeline showing we don't know how long that's going to be. <laughs> Oh, they are in 
neck deep at this point with their prophecies and ideas. I don't know why they're continuing to prophesy like this. They're just digging themselves a deeper hole. Okay, so it says 1919. That's another significant date to Jehovah's Witnesses. A lot of people don't know this. And actually, a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses don't know this. 1919 is a significant date because they say when Jesus came back in 1914, he inspected the world's uh, religions and picked one out to represent him. And that took five years. So 1919, here's what actually happened. Charles Taze Russell made that prediction about 1914, didn't come true, so he had to walk out and say the Gentile times are at an end, and then he made another end times prediction, 1919. When that one didn't come true, he had to come up with another explanation. So 1919 is significant in Jehovah's Witnesses lore or history because they believe it to be the year that Jesus picked the Watchtower Society as his chosen organization, his mouthpiece on earth. And it, so on this graph, it says, uh, under the 1919 marker, it says, the faithful and discreet slave, which is like the governing body, basically, appointed to shepherd God's sheep. And then it says, uh, there's a timeline uh, between 1919 and after Armageddon, it says, Last Days is what it's called. Faithful anointed ones brought together under the Messianic King, later united with a great crowd. And then under After Armageddon, it says, The blessing, I'm sorry, the blessings of the King's rule will last forever. So they're continuing to prophesy, they're continuing to lay down these ideas and ideologies, and and they're doing it without fear. I I honestly, that's ballsy because they're going to have to reverse course on some of these soon. They're not going to have an option. One of the prophecies that they came up with, it's called the second generation teaching. It's basically where uh, they said that somebody who was baptized and anointed, I think, or maybe just baptized, before Jesus came back, quote unquote, in 1914, uh, the end will come before that person dies, right? So there were plenty of people who were baptized as a as a, a Bible student, technically, at the time. That was Jehovah's Witnesses name back then. There were plenty of people baptized as a Bible student back then, before 1914. And the idea is that before that generation passes away, Armageddon will come. Well, it's been a hundred years. They're dead. And there's no Armageddon. So explain that. We need an explanation for that. So here's the explanation they gave. Uh, they took who they believed to be the very last person from that generation, who's Fred Franz. He was baptized in 1913. That's one year before, you know, Jesus supposedly came back invisibly. So he was baptized in 1913, and he died in, I think, like 1992 or 1993, somewhere in there, right? Uh, they suspect he was the very last Jehovah's Witness um, to have been baptized before 1914. So the end should have come before he died. So how do they explain that? They say anybody who was in the same who anybody who was baptized in his lifetime counts as his generation. So technically it's a contemporary, not the same generation. Um so basically it's kind of a complicated idea they have here, but they pretty much have 25 30 years before they have to revise everything. Before they have to completely... F I mean, they may even have to drop the 1914 teaching entirely. I don't know. But they've got some seriously hard decisions to make between now and, and say, 2040. It's going to be interesting to see what they choose to do. I will bet anything that what they choose to do is instead of revising their ideals and their ideologies instead of saying you know what maybe we got that wrong what they're going to do is they're going to buckle down and they're going to say we're in the middle of the great tribulation we're not inviting people into the religion anymore now we're knocking on doors and just telling them they're going to die that's the end of it 
Uh, I will bet that that's what they're going to do. I'm just wondering when they're going to do it. I put a lot of thought into this. I don't think they're going to commit mass suicide or anything, but I do think that they're going to claim they're in the Great Tribulation and just lock in, you know, just stop inviting people into the religion anymore. Uh, maybe even start living in bunkers. Who knows? I bet it's going to get crazy, though. But anyway, yeah, I appreciate you guys coming and giving this a listen. It's been interesting for me. Hopefully it was interesting for you, too. And I will talk to you next week.